Hi, everyone. Welcome back. I'm Adam Okada from Beyond Clean, and it has been such an incredible day of learning. I don't know about you, but all this talk about surface cleaning and disinfection has given me the urge to clean. I've been walking around here in between sessions with my antibacterial wipes, wiping everything down. So thank you for being engaged with the discussions we're having today. As a reminder, in the upper right-hand corner of your screen, you'll find many downloadable resources that have been provided to you uh, by our event sponsor, 3M. It's my pleasure to introduce our next guest. Jeremy Starkweather is the president and CEO of UV Concepts Incorporated. He has over 20 years of global medical technology experience, including product development, clinical study strategy and execution, and commercialization. Jeremy excels in upstream product development with a strong influence in downstream commercialization. He is a fellow industry disruptor, having launched many disruptive technologies in the healthcare industry. Jeremy's going to provide his insights and expertise on the emerging automated UV disinfection technologies that are helping to reduce the risk of surface contamination of non-critical medical equipment in the OR environment. He will discuss the basic principles of UV disinfection and how it's reducing a patient's risk for contracting a healthcare-associated infection. It's time to bring these issues to light, UV light, that is. So let's welcome in Jeremy. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. And um, in looking at the prior speakers, uh, I am really honored to uh, have the opportunity um, to provide uh, some of my viewpoints and to review some of the published clinical data and really kind of set the stage for where this uh, will progress, uh, we believe, in the future. So this is my first time on this platform. I'm going to make sure that I... Uh, keep everybody engaged uh, with, with, with uh, a little bit of videos, a lot of uh, pictures. Um, I was reviewing my presentation. Some of the pictures are a little fuzzier than I had hoped, and some of the prints a little bit smaller, but I will make sure to hit all the details. So let's get this started. No reason to go through uh, another title slide. Let me give you a little bit more about me. I want to put the disclaimer out there. I do have a financial relationship with UV Concepts. We develop, manufacture, market, and sell UVGI, ultraviolet germicidal radiation enclosures in the healthcare market for the purposes of improving the existing cleaning and disinfecting process for equipment. That's where we're focused uh, on the equipment side. So I founded the company in 2016, um, but I do have 23 years of medical device and equipment experience. That includes time in the OR, that includes time in flexible endoscopy lab, and it includes non-critical medical environments. So I do have an understanding of sterile processing, high-level disinfection, and standard and cleaning dis disinfection procedures provided by a lot of different uh, uh, departments, a lot of different personnel uh, throughout the healthcare environment. Um, I do have a financial incentive in this space. Um, I have a company in this space, but I will uh, present this objectively um, I won't go into any direct comparisons of our technology versus any other UV technology. I'm a supporter of all automated UV disinfection platforms as long as they are used appropriately. And I will also provide uh, expert opinion from uh, presentations and, uh, uh, and courses that I've been at in, oh, over the last few years. Let's look at the objectives. So. I want you to be able to articulate the risk associated with surfaces of non-critical equipment and about them being a potential vector transmission. Um, I will be focused a little bit more in this uh, OR environment, perioperative environment. Um, and then we'll describe some of the current cleaning and disinfecting methods. There might be some automated systems used in your facilities now, but for the most part, we know that uh, a lot of this comes down to the manual process I'll start talking about some emerging automated UV disinfection, and then I want to provide just the basic principles of UV disinfection. Each one of these sections, you could have a 60-minute talk about it, but uh, we're going to try to be pretty concise. As I, before we move into the details, I am going to play a video of an actual patient that contracted a healthcare-associated infection, in this case, C. difficile, um, this is a, it's a, it's an older video. It was actually published by USA Today. And it's the story of somebody that came in to the OR, had a procedure done, 
then contracted a healthcare associated infection. I wanna make a disclaimer. We don't know that she got this pathogen from the OR environment. It's a little bit difficult to figure that out sometimes when you're doing the, uh, the forensics on uh, a patient that has an HAI, but this provides you some insight to what it really means to the patient. Because you might see them coming into your OR and then they leave and you might not know what's going on afterwards if they unfortunately contract an HAI. So that's the first thing I'm gonna do. It is a four to five minute video, but I think it's a compelling video and uh, her name is Bailey. So we'll get that video started. C. diff is, what, what it did to me was I went from being like this, normal sized and everything, to swelling up like I was six months pregnant with 23 liters of fluid in one day. It was embarrassing because I knew how swollen I was and my back hurt from being swollen and my arms and my face and I couldn't eat. Anything would be better than this amount of pain. I wish I would just be over and I could just die. Clostridium difficile, or C. diff as it's commonly known, is a bacteria that exists naturally in the environment. In some patients, particularly those on certain types of antibiotics, it can colonize the intestine and it produces toxins that attack the gut. It can cause very grave complications and can prove to be fatal. She went in for her initial hospital on May 17. Uh, she came down with C. diff about May 20th, uh, 1920. Um, that's when the, she first became symptomatic. Just incompetent sort of creature that couldn't talk, and I lost all identity. Bailey had a very severe C. diff infection. She had a complication called toxic megacolon. Typically, when that complication arises, patients will have to have all or some of their colon removed. Our neurosurgeon told us, if not for the C. diff, she would have gone home in a week, and she would have been fine. She wouldn't have lost any school time. She wouldn't have, have been sick like this, and she wouldn't have nearly died. This is something that, you know, they say, well, nobody can, nobody can control what happens, but that's not true, that there's a lot of things you could do to control what happens in an environment like a hospital. Um, and those procedures need to be done, and, and they're not always being done. Hospital-acquired infections are a serious problem throughout the country, and we in the healthcare community take them very seriously, and that's no exception at Loma Linda University Medical Center. We have implemented uh, better room cleaning over the last few years, aggressive programs to increase the amount of hand washing. Our amount of C. diff has decreased by more than half over the last two to three years. I had a pick line which goes from your arm to your artery to your heart and put the medicine in through there. It's really cold actually. And that was how I got food and medicine which was keeping me alive. I had to have compressors on my ankles so I wouldn't lose circulation in my feet. They don't know how long because they've never seen anybody get better from this. As sick as she was, they've never seen anybody get better. I don't, I, I can't imagine anything worse than watching your child be sick and being unable to do anything about it. The emotional toll on the rest of the family was greater than we all kind of expected. And watching as this year has gone by, um, her dad went from no gray hair to quite a lot. Patients can play a big role in keeping the room environment clean and in being sure to keep their own hands clean. Since C. diff spreads predominantly through hand-to-mouth contact, it's very important that patients keep their hands washed. This is something that, that she's going to live with for a lot of years. She, In terms of her energy level, she's still very, very exhausted all the time. And where I would expect a 16-year-old to be in terms of energy level, she's not there. Bailey underwent a relatively new procedure called a fecal transplant in which healthy feces is implanted into the intestine of a infected patient and the healthy feces uh, repopulates the patient's intestines with healthy bacteria. 
now I'm fine. I'm concentrating on school just fine. I'm back to doing all the stuff I did before. When you get really close to dying, you realize how mad you'd be at yourself if you died and you hadn't done all the things you want to do. So your bucket list starts to get really long and really, really weird. My plan is to finish high school, to get as good as grades as possible, take as many AP classes as I can, go to college. I want to get a degree in neuropsychology. I'd like to get my PhD. I want to travel over the world. Mainly, I just want to make the world a better place. I don't want to be forgotten. So to do as much as possible and to have a really, really exciting life that somebody would want to read about. All right, so I always like to start with a patient story because I think it really brings it, um, it makes it obvious how important this whole area is. They showed a lot of room disinfection, patient room, but the patient journey is so much beyond that. So let's, let's look at our first object, objective, articulate the risk associated to surfaces of non-critical medical equipment, and that being a potential vector of transmission uh, for HAIs. Now, now this is, uh, my, my picture on the right didn't come out as much as I would have hoped, as, as, as clear as I would have hoped, but let's look at the definition. Infections which are not initially present or incubating when the healthcare is, is initiated, but subsequently develops. That comes from uh, Rick Marnello at uh, Yale. And if you look at this graph on the right, you've got your microbial communities, you've got humans, and you have the built environments. They all kind of work together as, as, as pass, passing uh, uh, pathogens uh, throughout. But patients enter new environments. They acquire new microbes into their microbiome. That's where you can have this uh, challenges related to uh, uh, surgical site infections. So they not only pick up microbes, but they also contaminate their, their environment. And uh, patients um, may be resistant to antibiotics. There's a lot of different things that, uh, that bring together with healthcare-associated infections, but we do know that surfaces of the environment can lead to HAIs. It's pretty clear. And so I mentioned the patient journey. So if you think about the OR experience, you have, let's call it 10 steps. You go get the patient from the room, transfer, transfer them to pre-op, get them ready for the procedure, then the procedure happens, and then they make their way back. It's not just that moment in time that happens in that OR theater. It's the moment that they begin that patient journey. So how do you control microbial contamination in the single patient journey? Because the operating theater, the operating room is only one aspect of that. I'm not even talking about the critical and semi-critical equipment being used. I'm talking about the non-critical surfaces that they're coming in contact with, much of which is uh, a, a medical equipment or what we consider non-critical medical equipment or also portable medical equipment. The, the patient comes in contact with all of it and it's not just about hand hygiene because hand hygiene impacts surfaces and surfaces impact hand hygiene. It needs, the entire ecosystem needs to be considered to truly keep the patient safe. So this comes from Curtis Donsky. Curtis Donsky is an epidemiologist from the VA in Cleveland. He has published a lot on surface contamination, the risk of surfaces, and he makes it pretty clear with his statement here, there's considerable evidence that portable medical equipment and shared devices may contribute to pathogen transmission I don't think that that is new news to people that are uh, uh, part of this presentation, but let's, uh, let's look at additional evidence. In another uh, article that he wrote, does improving surface cleaning uh, uh, in disinfection reduce healthcare associated infections? And he has this graph here talking about understanding the vectors of transmission. What's interesting is this graph primarily focuses on known infections and colonization. We know that you have rooms you have skin, bedding, clothing, portable medical equipment, hands of a healthcare personnel going to a susceptible patient. But the one little piece down here that's in the bottom, the unidentified carrier, is probably the most concerning 
Because if you know that there's an infection, you, if you know a patient's uh, uh, as an, a known colonization, you can do preemptive measures, you can do precautions, and you can do extra cleaning and disinfecting. But when you have an unidentified carrier, how are these patients, or what are these patients coming in contact with? They're coming in contact with healthcare personnel and equipment and their overall environment. I find this article to be interesting. This directly impacts it, uh, the OR example. Uh, this was published uh, in the American Journal of Infection Control. And what they did is they looked at the interactions between anesthesiologists and the environment while providing anesthesia care in the operating room. And they did this for eight hours, it ended up being seven surgical procedures uh, of observation. And what they found was that there were 1,132 touches between objects in that period, yet there was only 13 hand disinfections. Now, I won't read to you all the, the items. You're probably familiar with a lot of the items that are a part of that graph. But imagine that. Hand hygiene typically takes place before you touch a patient, but you're not necessarily doing hand hygiene between touches of the equipment. That would be nearly impossible to do uh, in an operating room theater uh, during the procedure because you're taking care of the patient. But hand hygiene should be addressed, but we also have to address the contamination of the non-critical medical equipment and imagine if you did this assessment of all members in the OR staff uh, over that eight hour period, what would that look like? Um, I spent plenty of time in the operating room and uh, in, in GI endoscopy labs, and there is a lot of activity from one piece of equipment to the next that's right next to the sterile environment, but uh, is still receiving a significant amount of hand touches, uh, and there's not necessarily uh, hand hygiene that's, that's happening between that. The whole purpose of, of bringing this up as an example is you need to be concerned with the decontamination of equipment to a level that is going to render it safe from uh, uh, pathogens. This is a a, a picture uh, of that, of those touches that I was, uh, of those simulations. So this was a simulation done, and they did the simulation of the surgery, and then they looked at room contamination um, after that surgery. So you think about this environment, how difficult is that environment going to be to disinfect? If the manual process is your primary means of disinfection, we might have some challenges that are difficult to overcome. This is gonna to lead to what we're gonna talk about in a little bit of providing additional automated means of disinfection through delivery of UV light. I wanna give this example. I deal a lot with uh, just the general environment deal a lot with portable medical equipment, with, uh, with, uh, with wheelchairs specifically. Um, this is another article published by Curtis Donsky, and uh, an article that he, a, a, a presentation that he actually did prior to this article was back in 2014. He randomly cultured 66 wheelchairs in his facility, and he found C. difficile and MRSA on 47% of them. Now that's startling. And it's right where you would expect the high-touch surfaces. It was the armrest, the handles, and the wheels. They redid some of that culturing in 2018. And what they found is that 30% had one or more pathogens, uh, including C. difficile at the rate of 25%, small number of MRSA, one VRE. And uh, the challenges associated with the portable medical equipment side of this is this is a, a graph of three days of activity of wheelchairs in that environment. It's over 800 interactions. And if you have 800 interactions and you have 30% of those with uh, uh, contaminated surfaces 
on high touch areas, you have to consider each one of those interactions as being a potential vector, uh, a, a vector point for the transmission to another patient. And that becomes challenging. So at what point do you intercept a piece of equipment, whether it's going into the OR or whether a patient's being transported by it? What, what point do you intercept that equipment and you provide a deeper cleaning disinfection? Um, between every patient would be great, Sometimes that's not possible in a very active workflow environment, but it's something that has to be considered because if we're only relying on the manual process, it's going to be tough. I won't even try to explain this, what, what this graph is by zooming in and showing you these different areas, but this is an example of a surgical intensive care unit where they evaluated the worker's hands and portable medical equipment and then they use this to show the potential uh, transmission opportunities. Uh, as you can see, this is very challenging. That graph represents a 24 hour period. So imagine you're 30 days into that. What does that graph look like? This is why better standards, better protocols are needed. So let's review objective one, articulate the risk. We know that the, if you control, control the microbial contamination can impact HAIs, it's well known. We know that surfaces are transport mechanism for microbial communities. We know that they pose, that, that non-critical and portable medical equipment surfaces pose a challenging risk because they're in a, such an active workflow environment like the OR or something as simple as transporting a patient. And we know that high touch interactions between healthcare workers and non-critical equipment adds to the difficulties. It actually, if you have bad surface, contamina surface decontamination, you really are starting to impact your efficacy of your hand hygiene compliance. They kind of work, no pun intended, hand in hand. So let's go to objective two. Let's describe some of the current cleaning and disinfecting methods for non-critical medical equipment in the OR. I'm gonna bring up some AORN uh, guidelines. You're not gonna be able to read this very well. I tried to summarize them. Obviously we know that perioperative personnel are typically responsible for the cleaning and disinfecting of high touch uh, uh, medical equipment. We also know that EVS will, will join in that, especially in room turnover and the overall environment. But what I typically see in clinical environments is that you have nurses and technicians and other staff that are associated with that department that take responsibility for the cleaning and disinfecting of the equipment that they are responsible for. Um, the AORN uh, says that you need to identify the high touch surfaces. And then you need to look at the frequency and extent that you need to disinfect those high touch surfaces. And then it's recommended that when you do this, you're doing it with a damp dusting with a facility approved disinfectant. That is, let's call it the standards. I'd put a red box around this one, talking about the OR and the procedure rooms. And this box says complete dust, damp dusting before a case cards, supplies and equipment are being brought into the room. Uh, what I would also say is what has happened to that equipment that is being brought into the room? So you've got this great environment in the operating room, but I've been there, equipment is moving in and out of that environment all, all the time. And, and that piece of equipment that's moving into that OR environment is now also contributing to the cleanliness of that environment. So it's not just about what's in the room, it's about what's being moved through in, in and out of that room and also in and out of your pre-op, your post-op, Let's call it your entire OR ecosystem. Let's look at the room environment. I just pulled this picture down and this, uh, you can't see the date on it very well, but it says August 10th, 2020, operating room of the future arrives at MUSC. Uh, and, and this was talking about, you know, great technologies that have been brought into the OR. And I love, I love technology in the OR. It's just getting better and better every day. But think about the complexities of cleaning and disinfecting all of that equipment that's inside that OR. Is it possible to consistently perform the manual process 
on complex equipment and environments. This is the challenge. This is the challenge. I put a couple other pictures on the right side. That top one is actually a cardiac ultrasound machine. And uh, if you look at that in detail, and you guys are familiar with this equipment, it has 100 different buttons, roller balls, joysticks, keyboards. I'm not quite sure if you can consistently get a chemical dwell time with a manual application that is good enough to kill all the potential pathogens that are on there. This is why bringing in automated technologies starts to make more sense, not only in the whole room environment, not only in the patient room environment, but in the OR environment. So let's talk about the manual process right now. I talk to folks in hospitals all the time, and they're like, we're trained our people, we're gonna have a, we're, we're, we have a chemical, we, we do the manual process, and sometimes they'll say to me, well, you know, UV can't, can't uh, replace the manual process. And I'm like, I 100% agree with you. UV, automated UV is a supplement to the process, but let's look at the manual process. There are a lot of different factors that impact the manual process between the amount of chemical, the type of chemical, the amount of pressure being applied, the, 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 the cloth that is, is applying it, and then just the responsibility of making sure that you hit all the high touch areas with the correct dwell time. It is not easy. It is not as simple and straightforward as, hey, yeah, we're just gonna wipe it down. Dr. Sitar did a complete review on this. And he said, wiping action and pressure are difficult variables to control and profoundly influence decontamination. I am a firm believer though you have to have ongoing training and education for anybody that's going to do the manual wipe down process for the means of removing contamination from, from, the, uh, from the equipment. His second bullet point, improper wiping can be counterproductive by spreading localized contamination over a wider area if not killed effectively at the point of contact. So you have a hard flat surface and you have a pathogen on it, wiping it, getting it wet, correct dwell time, correct pressure, that's possible. It becomes more difficult when you have a bunch of keys, roller balls, joysticks, buttons, complex geometries. This manual process becomes much more difficult. And I know when I look at the OR environment, I look at complexity of equipment, that's the reason why I believe that there is a, uh, a benefit for an automated uh, means of disinfection to supplement the wipe down. Of course, we have to remove soil. There's no question. We are a supplement, but we are a supplement that is needed for good reason. So overview, chemical dwell times, they have to be considered. You have human factors, consistency of technique, the surfaces are complex. And I wanna bring up one, one uh, last bullet point that's probably, it's not gonna be addressed now, but it's something to be thought about for the future. And my next slide speaks to it. Healthcare worker safety, exposure to harsh disinfectants, potential asthma and COPD risk. There is some class action lawsuits going on right now against a very large company that sells a very popular disinfectant, and the nurses uh, that were exposed to that showed severe respiratory problems with exposure. So this is something that is going to be uh, addressed in the future, and the question is, can automation or can other means of disinfection help with a reduction in exposure? This is the article that I'm uh, talking about, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you to the conclusion. Um, but this was uh, published by JAMA, 73,000 nurses across six years. It showed an occupational exposure was associated with a higher risk of developing COPD, 25 to 38%. They looked at very specific disinfectants. They pointed this directly, as you can see from the title, 
to the exposure of disinfectants. And the conclusions that came out of this is that they urge the need for exposure reduction strategies, development of new approaches, potential, potentially uh, safer, safer alternatives to include emerging non-chemical technologies such as steam and UV. Now that's not gonna happen overnight. And the only way that that is really gonna happen if you have technology companies that bring to bear new emerging technologies. Something to think about for the future. I know I think about that. And I think it's something that we all should be thinking about um, as we uh, move forward to try to improve this space. All right, did we cover objective number two? Well, describing the current cleaning and disinfecting methods for non-critical medical equipment in the OR. Well, high touch surfaces should be identified. You need to determine the frequency and the extent needed. How is equipment being brought into the OR environment being cleaned and disinfected before being introduced? Also the equipment that's inside the OR. And we need to understand that this complexity of the equipment provides a difficult environment. Um, I, solely, I firmly believe sole reliance on the manual process could leave gaps in quality assurance. And future direction should consider tar uh, strategies to reduce exposure to chemical disinfectants by the healthcare worker. So now let's go to objective three. Describe emerging automated UV disinfection methods uh, for non-critical. Before I get there, I wanna challenge the group, uh, the audience that's, that's, that's listening here. Hold on one second. So I wanna challenge the group. One of the primary solutions is that there's just a dedication to quality improvement. And I like to bring up uh, Joint Commission's COO. Accreditation is about continuous quality improvement, not passing a survey. In my opinion, if you identify some gaps in quality, which could lead to safety concerns, you're obligated to explore solutions or make the process better. I think exploring solutions uh, can, can benefit. Uh, I think we can all benefit from exploring emerging solutions because I think we've got challenges. Hey, Adam, I saw something come up on, uh, uh, on one of the questions that there was no sound, but uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what that, uh, I wanna make sure that we're, we're good. Yeah, I, I addressed that with uh, that person directly. So yeah, don't worry okay. about this. <laughs> okay, thank you. I was no hoping problem. I wasn't talking for 30 minutes and nobody can hear me. I knew that you would have no, jumped you're, in. So. Yeah, thank no, you. you're great. You're doing great. All right, let's move on. Okay, so what are some, some solutions uh, related to UV? I don't, like I said, I'm not gonna get into direct comparison because I have respect for all of my, uh, my colleagues that are in the UV uh, disinfection space. Um, you have in-room, let's call it movable, you have in-room movable uh, UV uh, emitters. There's multi-tower systems, there's single tower systems, there's tower systems that have lights, there's systems that, that provide, let's call it a room inside of a room. Uh, those are great for the OR environment. Uh, you're not gonna move things in and out of the OR all the time. You have things that are stationary. Um, and I think that, that utilizing these products are excellent. Um, then you have, let's call it in-room fixed. Let's say light sources that are like, uh, uh, that are in the ceiling that provide some constant uh, UV disinfection. Um, there are some, ex some, some folks exploring what's called far UV, which is a 222 wavelength. Um, there's some evidence showing that that is uh, uh, not harmful to humans, but there still are exposure limits. Um, but when you have something that's in room, you're a little bit further away from the surfaces so the further you're away, the little bit lo the longer it takes. So that has to be a consideration. You have handheld UV products, which uh, really rely on uh, doing it correctly manually. So 
To kill pathogens with UV, you have to have the correct dose. So dosage is all about exposure and it's about proximity. So if you're gonna use a handheld device, you, may have to, you, you might have to have a, a certain pace. And then you have chamber uh, enclosure products. Um, that's what we are a part of. And you have small chambers that can be used for everyday uh, uh, portable, uh, portable personal devices, you know, a laptop, a phone, what have you. There's kind of like some medium sized uh, UV chambers that could do, you know, mid-sized items. And then you have large enclosures that can do bigger portable medical equipment. Let me just put it like this. All solutions can provide pathogen reduction. We know UV light can kill pathogens, but it's really about how you deliver the UV. Do you get to the correct dosage? That is the key to UV disinfection. If you leave here with one thing, can that product that you're evaluating deliver dosage? And do, does that manufacturer, uh, are they able to provide evidence that they could have a, uh, a pathogen reduction um, uh, from a microbiology standpoint? It's literally that simple. Deliver a dose, because we know if you deliver the dose, you can kill pathogens. So, should automated UV solutions be considered at all? Well, we have about 10 years of experience, possibly more, that you can reduce pathogens, and there are publications that show that as part of a, a bundle of interventions that include UV, you're gonna reduce uh, HAIs. That's primarily in the patient room, that evidence. And I think that you could translate that information uh, and, and see how that could work in the OR because we know all these environments have pathogens. So yes, we're not sitting here from day one. It's been used in room for a long time. And I think we're now starting to see expansions in other departments. So we're always gonna have an emergence of multi-drug uh, resistant pathogens. They're gonna continue to challenge the healthcare environment. And I think UV can uh, help with that. Studies continue to show that 40 to 50% of surfaces that should be clean and disinfected in a patient room uh, are actually not white. That speaks to the challenges associated with the manual process. When you take equipment and you culture it, 30 to 50% of surfaces of non-critical medical equipment are contaminated with pathogens. Now, that's obviously gonna vary probably dramatically at different facilities. I'm just, I'm just stating evidence that has been published and evidence that has been not only uh, told by me today, but by experts that are much more qualified than me uh, to, to make these statements. Uh, I believe that sole reliance on the manual process leaves some gaps in quality assurance. And, you know, automated devices are essential to critical and semi-critical device processing. We've seen that in the GI endoscopy lab where it used to be a lot of manual uh, work. Now we have automated solutions. Well, if non-critical equipment is still a risk, wouldn't automation provide similar benefits that we've seen in this critical and semi-critical uh, environment uh, for, for years. There is a study, there was a meta-analysis done on no-touch disinfectant methods. 20 studies were reviewed, looked at C. difficile, MRSA, VRE, and other MDROs. And I took a couple quotes from here. Contact with hospital room surfaces or medical equipment can contribute to environmental transmission and leads frequently to the contamination of hands and gloves. Once again, there's a direct correlation between hand hygiene and surface cleanliness. And this review showed that using UV light, no touch technology to enhance environmental hygiene can decrease HAIs. It's a 20 study review. This is Curtis Donsky again. I love to put up his quotes. There in, there's, there's an argument in favor of decontamination devices because they reduce colonization. It's that simple. John Boyce, who uh, is an expert in this space, delivered this graph uh, or this, this table at, the, at, a, at a NIST IUVA workshop. IUVA is International Ultraviolet Light Association. Um, this was uh, in January 2020. 
And he looked at nine trials were evaluated to impact UV light on HAIs. Eight, eight of the studies were single facilities. One was an RCT. There are limitations because it is very difficult to uh, uh, identify one technology that can decrease uh, HAIs. It's very, very challenging, whether it's UV light or something else. So there were limitations. A lot of them were single center. Uh, there was differing criteria for types of rooms, differing uh, criteria for number of cycles, locations, duration, uh, the types of liquid disinfections that were, disinfectants that were used, compliance of personnel. It's not perfect, but I think that we are starting to build amount of, a, a decent amount of evidence that, yes, we know UV light can uh, kill pathogens on surfaces. Does that matter? And I think we're starting to see that it does matter. I will put up this AOR in evidence rating model. I think this is interesting. So if you look at the evidence rating, high, moderate, or low, I think UV falls in this moderate range. Now, the definition is tough to read, but it says few studies, some have limitations, there's no major flaws, and there can be variation. So I think you have to look at the evidence being moderate. And then if you look at the definition of the recommendation rating, either recommend, uh, it's, it's recommended or it's, con it's a conditional recommendation, you know, if you look at the recommendation, the benefits exceed the harms. I think the, the benefits of UV exceed the harms because reputable UV medical, uh, UV device manufacturers should have safety features built in that prevent exposure uh, to personnel. And providing this uh, is, is effective. So yeah, I think the benefits clearly exceed the harms. It's supported by high to moderate quality evidence. We still have some work to do as an industry to make that happen. And it may be based on low quality evidence if you have expert opinion uh, when it's difficult to obtain high quality evidence, uh, or it could be supported by a guideline. So my question is, should a recommendation or conditional recommendation be made for the use of UV light in the OR environment? I believe there's moderate evidence, and I believe the benefits are likely to exceed the harms. And I think that you could fall yourself in this recommendation or conditional recommendation phase. So I think that's how perioperative uh, leaders need to look at uh, UV light. So objective three, describe emerging automated technologies. I didn't go into those too much, uh, but I think that you've got the basic uh, gist of, of, of some of the technologies. You have in-room movable. They can be moved, which makes them good for ease of use, uh, but it does require setup. It requires personnel, and there can be a disruption of the active workflow environment, um, which could uh, be challenging related to turning rooms over. Um, that's kind of similar to uh, uh, what, you, what you see in the whole room environment or the patient room environment. Um, you have fixed lamps, requires no setup. It takes a little bit longer uh, to do the cycle because it's in the ceiling. Maybe that's something that could be done, you know, in the evening or night or, or, or when, a, when a room's down. You have handheld devices, similar, but manual operation. And then you really get into the enclosures. And I believe the enclosures have good repeatable dosage because you have a, a fixed environment. There's no variability in that environment. But you need to bring, the price, you need to bring things to it. So um, the clinical evidence does exist showing that automated UV disinfection can provide a pathogen reduction and reduce HAIs. The evidence is there, even if it uh, has some limitations. So final objective, and I've got six minutes to get through the final objective, and then we'll get to the Q&A. So let's just describe the principles of UV disinfection and how that could impact surface disinfection in the OR. Believe it or not, I'm not a UVC expert even though I'm speaking on that today. I'm more of an implementation expert of technologies that are disruptive, but that can provide clinical benefit. And I say I'm not an expert because there is a lot of experts out there that, uh, that, are, that really, really uh, understand the science of how it works. One thing that I know is it kills pathogens, and it does that by preventing it uh, from uh, replicating um, at the DNA level. 
And uh, UVC is this, let's call it this potent disinfecting range. It's non-visible. And it's, uh, I mean, we, we've, you, two, 254 nanometer uh, is a wavelength that's done with uh, mercury lamps. There are some other wavelengths that, that fit into the UVC world. Um, what's important to know is that UVC kills pathogens, prevents it from replicating. Here's what I believe is important. There's a direct correlation between UVC dosage and pathogen reduction. So what drives dosage? And this has to be considered as you consider products uh, in your space. Number one, what's the power of the source? The more power you have in the lamps, the more potent it is. What's the distance from the target surface? It's very, very important. It actually has one of, it's actually one of the most critical variables to consider. If I am one foot away, the dosage is gonna be dramatically different than if I'm 10 feet away. If I'm 10 feet away, I'm gonna to have to have more time. So this correlation between time and distance is what is important to be considered. So if you have a perioperative environment, you have an OR environment, and uh, you put a, a, a one tower, um, you're gonna to have to expose that for longer. If you have three towers or different arms, you name it, um, you're gonna be able to reduce uh, time. If you have an enclosure environment, you're gonna know your dosage and uh, the time is we're gonna be more set. Um, so power of the source, distance, the line of sight is critical. Whether it's direct, angled, or shaded, that impacts, dos that impacts dosage and then of course time. And the fact, the, the straight fact is there are different pathogens have different resistance to UVC just as they do with chemical disinfectants. So we can kill viruses and MRSA super fast, but a C. difficile in the uh, spore might take longer. So here's what I challenge you to think about as you are evaluating technologies. UV dose delivery should be controlled or monitored to achieve consistent results. You have to, you have to know that. You either have to have confidence in that device controlling it or confidence that you're monitoring it or a combination of the two. And UV device manufacturers should be able to provide you evidence that they can provide a consistent dose or monitor a consistent dose and uh, deliver, that, uh, deliver that dose uh, to the corresponding path in your reduction. This is evidence that they should be able to give you. Curtis Donsky published this. Uh, this is just an example of how increasing the dosage provides a better log reduction. So I won't get into the, the details of this, but it's pretty simple. The longer you go, the more dose you have, uh, the, the better pathogen inactivation. Um, and it, it, it has a direct correlation. This is some of our own pathogen inactivation. We showed the same thing. The longer time that you go, the better the log reduction, because the longer you time that you go, the more doses that you have. This is a description of how angles can impact. You see that MRSA is less impacted by different angles or shades. When you get in shaded, you can see the green MRSA goes down. And then you can see a little bit more impactful with C. difficile because it's more resistant. So that's why you have to think about line of sight uh, when you are delivering UV. Um, this is an example of how we model irradiance and dosage. We've got this environment and we make sure that we don't deviate in different areas of this environment so we can deliver a dosage. So in review of this section, all these solutions can provide pathogen reduction which we believe can impact HAIs. But the selection depends on your targeted devices or surfaces, it's called equipment types, uh, and your workflow. So you might wanna choose one of these versus the other because your workflow is, is, is uh, more uh, active and, and quick moving. So objective four, 
describe the principles of UV disinfection and how they can impact surface. Dosage is the key. It's driven by, it's driven by the source, the distance, the line of sight, and the time. Dosage must be effectively delivered to the target surface. You have to think about angles and shadowing. And device manufacturers should be able to prove that the dosage delivery, uh, uh, their dosage delivery and corresponding pathogen reduction. That's the end of my presentation. Adam, I apologize. I'm 20 seconds past 50 minutes, but I'm ready for, I'm ready for some questions. That's all right. We will punish you later, Jeremy, but um, it's absolutely fine to go 20 seconds over. Um, we got a few questions in the chat, um, so I wanted to uh, give you some of those Q&A ones. Um, yep. So how do you feel about UV room disinfection between OR cases where there are short turnaround times? I think this is the challenge, right? So I think you, you need to develop, if you want to, if you want to, if you're a part of the OR and you want to develop a strategy that utilizes UV because we know it works, you have to consider your turnaround times as you've pointed out. You might consider a strategy that is utilizing UV light at the end of the day, maybe in the evening with, a, with an evening staff. Um, your turnaround time is going to be what's going to be because you have to have that. If you don't have time for a 15, 20 minute UV cycle because you can't be in that room, I've been in the OR environment, you have a wipe down, you, you have wipe down and kind of setup that's happening simultaneously sometimes. So it can be tough. So what I would say, if you're concerned about turnaround time, you need to figure out where it fits into your schedule. And that could be in the evening, or that could be simply, you know you have that OR that's down uh, for a couple of hours, just not being filled and, and, and go ahead and, and do it from there. But that is really based on each individual hospital's environment. But I do think there, in any, in any of these environments, there is a strategy that could benefit from UV, uh, automated UV cycle, whatever that strategy might be. Gotcha. I know that, um, you know, when I was at the facility and I was working on the PM shift, I saw in the middle of the night, I was over in one area in the middle of the night, and I saw our EVS team with a disinfection machine in the room, and I was kind of asking them questions because yeah. it was new. it was a new concept to me at the time. And I said, you know, what is this? Yep. And what are you doing? And and I asked them about placement in the room. It's very interesting that you went into like where where do you put the machine? You have to look at shadows and and distance and things like that. And because I asked them, well, where do you put the machine? They're just like, I stick it in the door and we just turn it on and we wait fifteen minutes yeah. and we take it out. And so I think I think there probably does need to be some training that happens with staff uh, when they get those Agreed. machines to make sure that they are using them correctly. Um, That's so right. Let's see here. Yeah, let's see. Here's another one. Um, UV disinfection requires a manual wipe down or surface cleaning to be effective uh, before use. Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah, and I love and I love what you the the part you put in earlier about the the wiping action and the pressure uh, applications yep. uh, to to that process um, because that's applicable to sterile processing as well. You know, and I think that not Absolutely. we don't really know how good a job people are doing. We know that will it'll say you know brush vigorously or brush to get contaminants off, but yep. there's not really a correct time. You don't know what different people, there's a variance between how one person is doing it to the next person. And, you know, obviously I've seen people do wipe downs of let's say case carts um, in the sterile processing space where they'll wipe down a case cart with a disinfecting wipe. And it's just like a one surface wipe, real light, you know, they go over to the surface and who knows whether that's actually getting off. But I, I love that point. I think that's definitely an important takeaway from today. And, and, is, and Adam, uh, to, to, to that point, we always are going to have to train and retrain and train and retrain on the manual process. You got to remove soil 100%. But bringing in automation is going to help the environment. There's no doubt in my mind. Sole reliance on the manual process, if it was... If it was as easy as we would hope and, and didn't require like, you know, human factors, then when, when we would culture these surfaces, they'd be good. We've been culturing surfaces for years with the manual wipe down process. And I think there's gaps. I think you have to address the gaps on two fronts, continue training on the process and providing automated solutions. 
Yep, absolutely. I agree with that. Um, so here's a question. Um, how would do you, how would UV disinfection work in the sterile processing department? I don't believe that it has, uh, I don't believe we're in a space with UV where, where we're anywhere close to being that, that being used for critical and semi-critical products. Where I do think you could find yourself useful in uh, sterile processing department is if you wanted to clean the whole, the, the environment, the same way that you'd clean the OR environment. You guys are bringing in dirty instruments. You have your own processes to clean your environment, but, but could UV be used for environmental cleaning inside the sterile processing, not associated with critical and semi-critical devices? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, you know, that's something you'd probably go to an expert at the individual companies and say, you know, I was interested in using uh, UV disinfection for my sterile processing department yep. uh, to disinfect surfaces and things like that. Um, it would be effective in a way that you couldn't have the, um, you know, the sprayers or the misters. Um, those are a different technology and probably could impact yep. some of the things in sterile processing. So UV light might be a better alternative uh, in the sterile 100%. processing department for those types of things. And you can even think about you can even think about like you know the the carts that are transporting the sterile product products up to the OR, you know what kind of environmental cleaning, cleanliness is happening to those? Yeah, absolutely, that's a good point. Yep. Um, let's see. Is there an impact of UV technology on um, eye or skin physiology, and how is this uh, accounted for? It is. So it can damage your retinas and it can burn your skin if, you be, if you're exposed to UVC. Now, FAR UV222 is trying to make claims that it has, it, it's, it's making claims that it has less impact on that, but it's safe for eyes and skin. I still don't think we ha know all of the details related to that, uh, related to the amount of exposure that you can have, because it's gonna do something, but yes, so UV disinfection, as it is today, if it's going to be delivered, you need to keep it away from people. So the way the tower systems work is you block off the room, you have a sensor uh, on the door, and then the lights turn off when you, when you do it. Uh, our situation, we have an enclosed environment, so we actually shield um, all the UV from, from escaping the chamber, but it has to be addressed if you're going to deliver it uh, safely. You have to protect eyes and skin. And that's usually by just keeping, pe keep pe keeping people separate from it. Yep. Excellent information. Um, do you help hospitals find that ideal placement for UV disinfection within their individual spaces? Absolutely. I can speak from our experience. Um, since we have an enclosed environment, equipment goes into it. Um, and we will actually meet with each individual department. So sometimes it's patient transport, sometimes it's the ICU, sometimes it's radiology. And it's a really a discussion about their workflow. And it goes back to the AORN uh, recommendations and guidelines. Identify the high touch surfaces, identify what the extent and, uh, and, and, and what's the extent that that needs to be disinfected. That could be, there could be items to identify that should be done between every single patient. I know with portable medical equipment, um, in the OR environment, and even sometimes, and even outside the OR environment, you could have a piece of equipment that's going bedside, doing treatment. There's hand hygiene that takes place, but now you have a piece of equipment that's gone high touch between the patient and the healthcare worker. And so I think there can be different criteria um, for a room environment, uh, like uh, the tower systems, I think this is a situation where you sit and you talk about workflow, you talk about a periodic protocol, you talk about uh, a frequency because you want to have success. You don't want to put a bar so high that I'm going to deliver UV, uh, uh, you know, between every patient if you can't achieve that. That that doesn't do any good. So I do think it is a collaborative discussion between department leaders, infection prevention and the, uh, the company that's providing the technology, which sh that company should know the effectiveness from distance and time uh, and be able to give you those answers very, very directly. Yep, absolutely. 
Uh, well, thank you, Jeremy, for such a great discussion about this innovative disinfecting technology. Uh, it's truly been enlightening. Uh, if you have any uh, questions we weren't able to get to, you can send Jeremy an email and he will gladly answer them. As a reminder, there will be a short 15 minute break before the next session. We're glad you're here and we'll see you back here shortly. Yeah, and I want to I want to make one point if I have one minute. I know the time just sure. hit. I will, feel free to reach out to me with any questions. Um, I'm going to give my email address here. It's just Jeremy, J E R E M Y S at uvconcepts.com. Feel free to reach out to me with any questions uh, that you have as as a follow up. Absolutely. And we do have a few more in chat we weren't able to get to. So I'm, I'll make sure that Jeremy gets your questions and feel free to email him with any others you have. All right. We'll see you in the next session. Bye, guys. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Jeremy. Bye.